I was looking for um, a book that I really that I could sell, and uh, in desperation, I took a thousand mile hike across Oregon, figuring I'd get two books out of it. One is an adventure story of uh, hiking all the way across Oregon from the westernmost point to the easternmost point, and the other would be a guidebook to uh, wilderness areas, and that worked. The adventure story became uh, listening for coyote, the story of this thousand mile hike where I was held at gunpoint by marijuana growers and poisoned myself with mushrooms, wound up hiking 40 miles a day through Hell's Canyon trying to outrun these October snowstorms, and it was uh, it was a top travel book of the year by the New York Times. It was a finalist for the Oregon Book Award. It was chosen one of Oregon's 100 books. It kind of launched my career as uh, the hiker guy. And at that point, I realized I can use that to, to write guidebooks. And these then have become sort of my bread and butter. There's five books that cover every trail in the state, and I update them every year. I actually give away a free copy to anyone who finds an update I've missed. Uh, and, uh, and so they're, uh, they're like printing money. I mean, you, they, they just fly off the shelves. Here we are. This is Rakestraw Book Design Live Events. I'm with, uh, well, well, most people call him Bill, but you probably know him by William L. Sullivan. He's actually a man who's written a lot of stuff. I, the guy has written a huge amount of books. First of all, on hiking. He is the guy, if you want to know about hiking through Oregon. Do you go up into Washington or is it just Oregon? I cover Oregon, but I lap into Washington a bit in California. All right. I also know him by his uh, other writings and that's his fiction which i've enjoyed immensely you have a couple of those the one i haven't got to and i apologize i haven't read the one about the ship the, oh, the ship in the hill yeah a, a viking no, yes yeah not just hiking but viking, viking. See? Well, see see <laughs> and also his wonderful he figured out who db cooper was and what happened with it and he also knows what uh what's going on with einstein so he's got a lot of good stuff going on there and also uh the deeper wild which i just found out about so that was one of his first books he put together first novels yeah so what got you into writing first of all bill i mean what well, makes I... a sane human being <laughs> put this all together well i grew up in oregon of course but my father was the editor of the newspaper in salem so writing was always a part of my background and I think he was kind of, um, he wished he could have written books instead of just writing editorials and putting together the paper. And so when I went to college, I decided to study creative writing and not go into newspaper journalism, figuring that that'd be easier to be a freelance writer than to have to put out the paper every day. He worked hard, you know, and a lot of the people in the newspaper business back then died young of alcoholism and ulcers, uh, smoking all the time. I figured, ah, it'll be so much easier to be a freelance writer. Well, it turns out it was actually a lot harder, I think, um, because you have to write books on speculation, and who knows if people will buy them. But uh, I've done 17 now, and it's turned out well. So you do make a living from this. I mean, you are a professional writer. That's the thing people, because you hear about people writing books. And nowadays, um, with the advent of digital publishing mm -hmm. and all that, a lot of people are now writing and putting stuff up there. Um, that How does that affect your um, bottom line with that? Are you feeling there's some competitiveness there, or does that not seem to get in your way. I know that most of yours is um, nonfiction, which also yeah. makes it easier because I know that fiction is a hard, bear. Hard a bear. sell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I've um, done these 17 books. I'll but, show them that. Um, and it's, it's true that the nonfiction is easier to sell. I think that's generally true that uh, people will walk into a bookstore asking for, do you have a I guide to things to do around here and they don't walk in and say do you have a, like a novel about a suburban housewife's angst um, so it's that's kind of the day job 
is uh, writing how-to books and, and guide books and things like that, nonfiction. But the fiction is fun, and uh, I've become much more successful with that. I've been a full-time writer for 30 years, and for the last 23, I've made a living at it. So the first seven were really hard. We're talking just no money, struggling. Uh, but uh, then, well, now that I have a, quite a few books under my belt, uh, sales go just fine. And the is that due books, to having like a menu? Is that like the, ba the base idea that with more books you have, you have a menu of offerings to people? Is that why it's gotten easier? Yeah, you become a brand. Uh, if, if you just have one book, it is harder. If you have a series, then people start buying the others in the, in the series. And the bookstores are more likely to stock it if they know about you. And by now, they do know about me. And the internet has uh, not been a problem for me. I'm uh, converting, I've converted my books into ebooks, and I think it's probably only 20% of my sales now is electronic books, but you don't have to actually print them. <laughs> uh, and the money just shows up in your bank account, and uh, if you've got, you know, $500 a month coming in that way, that's actually not uh, not too bad. Now, there's a lot of people who like to make five hundred dollars a month with their writing. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just the ebook. I know, I know. So I'm just saying that books, that's it. Physical books are still a much bigger part for me. Right, I, I agree with that. I think when we see the numbers out there, and that's one I've been noticing the last few years as they talk about how ebooks have overtaken the sales of paperbacks and. By percentage, I would believe so as of sales, because when you start from zero hmm. and suddenly sell a huge amount of readers that people then have to put e-readers that people have to put books on, of course, the book sales will go up for e-books. I still believe that uh, paperback books make the largest amount of money myself personally. When I take a look at the numbers, oh. it's paperback is still the place people go. Um, there's nothing against um, e-books. Matter of fact, I love them myself. I have a lot of them. Uh, but I, I think that they, I don't believe you'll see paperbacks go away. Well, the author uh, should make the same amount, whether it's an ebook it's or, or a physical book. It's the bookstore and the printer that lose out on that. Uh, so the authors should come out the same. Just don't give your work away for free. <laughs> don't put it up on the internet for free. That is, And then uh, in terms of these guidebooks and how-to books, people prefer, often prefer, the physical book. If you're going to take it with you on a hike, it's harder to take your laptop along. Uh, people do it. Uh, we'll take an iPhone and look at the map and I I expand it on. I have that, but if you drop it in the creek, it's a lot less useful than if you dropped a physical book. You can still read it after you drop it in the creek. So, people still are buying paper books. Correct. So, what got you into doing hikes? What made you... Was it just a lifelong passion that you were able to turn into a lifelong job? I, I guess. I mean, I'm not much more passionate about hiking than most people in Oregon. It's a pretty common thing here. Um, always go hiking, like camping, like everybody else in Oregon. Uh, but um, I think it was actually at the end of those seven hard, hard years. And I was looking for um, a book that I really, that I could sell. And uh, in desperation, I took a thousand mile hike across Oregon, figuring I'd get two books out of it. One is an adventure story of uh, hiking all the way across Oregon from the westernmost point to the easternmost point. And the other would be a guidebook to uh, wilderness areas, and that worked. The adventure story, we came uh, listening for Coyote, the story of this thousand-mile hike where I was held at gunpoint by marijuana growers and poisoned myself with mushrooms, wound up hiking 40 miles a day through Hell's Canyon, trying to outrun these October snowstorms. And it was, uh, it was a top travel book of the year by the New York Times, it was a finalist for the Oregon Book Award. It was chosen one of Oregon's 100 books. It kind of launched my career as uh, the hiker guy. 
And at that point, I realized I can use that to, to write guidebooks. And these then have become sort of my bread and butter. There's five books that cover every trail in the state, and I update them every year. I actually give away a free copy to anyone who finds an update I've missed. Uh, and, uh, and so they're, uh, they're like printing money. I mean, you, they, they just fly off the shelves. Uh, but that's because I really, really work hard to keep them up to date and put lots and lots of information into them. And then that kind of supports my, uh, the other fun writing I do, which is, uh, you know, hike all summer, but then in the winter, I can uh, write these uh, fun novels like about D.B. Cooper, the skyjacker who parachuted with a quarter million dollars and has never been found. Well, what happened to him? That seems like it cries out for fiction. You need to have a Portland police detective track him down. That is great, cause, and that's what I did. I loved that. I, that book was great. That was just a fun time. I, 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 enjoy, I enjoyed the, uh, that was the uh, Einstein, too, the uh, case of Einstein's... Yes, D.B. Cooper was... And then Einstein's... Um, Violin. violin yeah oh, that was great that was great uh, I, that was also fun <laughs> yeah it is and a great style i love your style in those those are wonderful you you make somebody feel like they're there and you picked an interesting i loved uh in the violin i loved how you would start each chapter and tell me who was going to be talking that chapter well you know about making you feel like you were there uh the trick for that was um that book is set all through europe as uh, the, this, uh, my two main characters uh, find a missing Einstein formula. And then they're chased by spies through Europe and have to figure out how their family got this formula and what it means basically before the bad guys blow up the planet. But uh, So in, in writing the book, my wife and I spent six months traveling around Europe. And I wrote the book as we did the actual trip. So when we were in the Greek islands, I wrote about the spies tracking them down to this monastery on a remote Greek island. When we were in Italy, uh, I had the spies chasing them over the Italian Alps. Uh, when we were in Germany, they were tracking down the town where Einstein was born in Ulm to figure out, the, have all the clues come together at the end. Now I think that made it more a little more realistic. Maybe that's a trick I learned from the hiking guides. People can tell if you haven't been there. Yeah. And that is, you actually hike all those hikes. You've actually gone those trails. So that's the best part about reading your books, is that you're not just getting somebody who compiled some information they found somewhere. This is a person who's actually walked each one of those steps along that trail. Yeah, and I, I re-hike them on a seven-year schedule. Uh, so, so I do a lot of hiking. <laughs> so how many miles do you get in a year, do you know? Oh, thousands. I don't wow. know. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I used to do hiking years ago. I was uh, I did the enchantments up in Washington oh, yeah. State about three times. I adore that hike. Mm -hmm. I did the Wonderland Trail around uh, Mount Rainier. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful hike. That's like going over different landscapes all mm -hmm. the time. That was a beautiful hike. And then, of course, along the coast. I, I love the coast. So, yeah, that was when I was younger and had more time. So, uh, with your style of writing um, and knowing where you wanted to go with your writing, with your career, um, what is the part you love the most about it? Huh. Well, it's really, there's two sides. Uh, the, the, the guidebooks actually require that my wife and I go travel around remote parts of Oregon, stay in bed and breakfast, and go visit hot springs. I mean, I'm, we're paid to do this. Uh, so, I, I love that research, and, and it's neat to get physical with it. But then uh, the other thing I really love is uh, is having time to come up with some interesting fiction plots. And for that, what we do is we have this log cabin that we built by hand. I have a book of this is an adventure memoir about building this log cabin that my wife and I built by hand out in the wilds of the coast range. And there's no road to this cabin. You have to hike in a mile and a half to get there. We built it using only hand tools, because no chainsaw, right? Uh, there's no electricity, no telephone, no mail service. So I have a typewriter. 
out there. And this is like the best place to write fiction. Guys, you, uh, there's no input all day long except what's going on in your mind. And you can, uh, if you have come, to a, come up against a plot problem that does, you just hit an impasse, a uh, writer's block thing, sleep on it. And the next morning, it's all sort of gels together. You go out, and with the typewriter, um, it's, it's a slower process, a little bit. Uh, but uh, I, I think you, it, it maybe is actually more, uh, it worked, for me it works better for writing fiction. And certainly having that kind of isolation really, really helps. So I, I really enjoy that, to go out and uh, spend a lot of the summer uh, writing at this log cabin with a typewriter. That's amazing. I, and I love hearing that story. I, I, when I read about it and also taught to you before, I thought, now that's the way to do it. Go out there. Don't have a, you know, a, a word processor. So how long did you go before you ever started using a word processor? I know it's, they've been around for quite a while, but how long before you started it becoming the common everything as a computer, basically? Oh, from the first. I mean, you got to have them. I mean, for editing, it's just like the only way. And to be honest, I, I do write, you know, most of the hiking books and stuff on the computer here. But uh, it's not the only way. And realistically, what, you're writing a thousand or two thousand words a day? Uh, it doesn't take that long to type that. Uh, so that's not the real, what takes time. When I get back from the log cabin, I have to retype everything into the computer, but it, it just takes moments. Yeah, yeah all of my books have been done obviously on computer. I lay them out myself. Uh, and the, like this one is a sort of the wussy hiking guide to Oregon. Hey, you might go for this now. You're, you're, you're looking for something. <laughs> this is the one with the hot springs and the bed and breakfast and the easy hikes, but it's, it's all in color. And uh, took 800 photographs and learned to lay this all out myself. So those are like day hikes? Yeah, they're, they're, they're the prettiest hikes in Oregon. I, I sort of cherry-picked the best and did the color maps that are so visual it even shows where the photographs are taken. Um, uh, so it's, yeah, highlights. But the this is, the, I, I think, for, for me, another part of being a writer is now uh, you, can, you can design your own books. Uh, it, you can get better at this. It's possible to do a very bad job of this, but uh, I've uh, learned to design the books as well. So you've taken on basically then producing your own books. Mm -hmm. Did you used to go through a publishing house, or have you always produced your own books? No, I, I did uh, the, the old route. I mean, with a, an agent and a publisher in New York, and then uh, and then Seattle uh, and Texas. But I finally, I've gradually gotten the rights back to all of those books, except one. And uh, I'd much rather publish them myself. They're all published now with the Navalis Press, which is Sullivan spelled backwards. So it's really just me in this office <laughs> putting them out. And that way I have a lot more control. The books never go out of print, which otherwise the publisher will let it go out of print. And for six years, they will hang on to the copyright and not let you reprint it. Or they'll do something stupid with it, a crazy picture on the cover. Or uh, there are just so many ways that I've been cheated by publishers and disappointed by them. Uh, you imagine that they'll do all the publicity. This does not happen anymore. The publishers turn it over to the author to book their own tours and set up their own presentations and book signings. I'm sorry. The, the publishers no longer... I mean, maybe for a, a dozen big name people. Yeah, if you're a Stephen King or... Maybe, a, yeah. or a, you maybe know. but look, even Stephen King is publishing his own now. Right. He's, he's backed away from the publishers, too, for the same reasons. Uh, they're mostly not earning their keep anymore. And some very, very good stuff is being self-published now because it just simply makes sense. Well, uh, being a person who did theater for years, 
I knew a lot of actors who were fantastic just because they didn't have a contract and weren't on uh, in a movie or on television and people never knew them. They were some of the best actors I ever knew. And these were people who went from regional theater to regional theater. And you know, they had a following, but they were nothing like uh, the big giant actors. So yes, being independent doesn't mean you have a lesser product. But it does take work. I mean, and that's where we come up to the next part of this whole interview is the work that you do to get your books known. Um, and I, this is something that I found amazing. Um, the first time I met you was a couple years ago. We put our name and got a, found out who you were and sensed that we had written a book and we'd like to be at the uh, Lane County Fair. And you graciously said, please, yeah. and let us go there. And I got to see you in action. You know, it's one thing to walk by the author's table, which I've done many times for many years. Matter of fact, my dream was always to sit at that table. Mm -hmm. So thank you for making that happen. That was fantastic. Um, but what was amazing was to sit by you and listen to how you work your readership. People coming up to the table. You know you have people who come to you all the time. You also know people who are just discovering you. And the time it takes for you to work with them and work them through each of your books. And I hardly ever see anybody walk away without buying a book. From you. <laughs> and that's amazing. I have to, because being a person who's been in sales for years, I did all kinds of different sales. And I prided myself on being a good salesman. Selling books is a whole different animal. And to watch you was amazing. And it wasn't sales. It was somebody who actually has a love of what he's doing, mm -hmm. um, you know, a true passion for what he's doing, and a passion for all the other writers. And to put together these, what we would call book fairs, and you put a huge amount of them together a year, because basically you wanted to be able to have people find your books, mm -hmm. is what I'm thinking. Uh, yeah. Why don't you go through that and explain how that evolved? Because it is now... A huge business itself or at least a huge vocation because okay. there's not like you know you make money at it but it's more like getting all the authors together that must be uh -huh. you know a nightmare to have to get a hold of everybody and make sure they show up um well as bookstores become fewer and fewer authors wind up having to do more and more of their own promotion and selling of their books so how do you how do you get that to the people and i've organized uh, i organized three author book signing events here in Eugene, uh, one at the, uh, an author's table at the Art in the Vineyard Festival on the 4th of July weekend uh, down in a park, and then the, at the Lane County Fair, and then uh, the Authors and Artists Fair each December, which is a fundraiser for the, the Lane Library League. Uh, and in each case, I get 40 or 50 authors, local authors, signed up to come out and sell their books. And some of them are new at this uh, and just sit there and don't look at people and just sort of wait for them to come and buy the book and walk away. Well, it doesn't happen. You have to, you have to uh, engage people. You don't, you don't have to thrust the book in their face or, or assault them, but if they look at the book, then you tell them about it. And, and, and that's really just it. You, don't, you, you just tell them about it. And because you wrote the book, you've got to care about it. You've got to be, but you, you just have to tell them why you wrote this book and why it's so interesting. And then uh, often that enthusiasm does catch on. So the, these, it's part of the promotion uh, for authors. So this is the doing the publicity yourself because a publisher isn't going to do this. So you've got to find ways to get your book out to people. These authors' fairs were are one way, and they also raise money for good causes. Now, how do they, uh, like this one we're doing in December, I believe December 7th, mm -hmm. Saturday, December 7th, um, how do they make money for that organization? What is, what is the, um, well, what, how is the income stream made for them? Well, the authors have to donate 25% of their sales to the Lane Library League, which pays for the room and has enough money left over to fund summer reading programs for rural children throughout Lane County. A good cause. Very good cause. Very yeah. good cause. Yeah. And then 25%, that means for most authors get their books at like 50% discount usually, so they're still making something and, and helping out at a good cause too. Right. And that one event, this uh, Authors and Artists Fair, the first Saturday of December each year, it's held at the Lane County Fairgrounds 
right next to Holiday Market. And uh, that one is invitation only. So we have a, a committee of three people that sort through 700 uh, local authors and pick 40 or 50 to invite to that event. And we, there's quite a bit of publicity. You'll see ads on uh, the radio, KLCC, and article in the paper usually about this. And, and uh, people make a point of coming there to buy holiday gifts. And the neat thing is you get it autographed. Uh, the author's right there, and you talk to them. And sort of my job in organizing this is a little bit to help the authors uh, do that, do their work. They've got to meet the people's eye, tell them about their book, and explain why it's so great. And there are some really amazing books going to be at this event in December. I mean, we've got everything, mystery, romance, kids' books, you name it, and so top names. Yeah, some major people. I mean, even the artwork was done by the lady who does, uh, was it Stone Soup? Jan Elliott. Yeah. Right. She'll be there. She has, I think, eight collections of her uh, Stone Soup cartoon book. A couple of other humor authors as well. Right. Leanne Joshua was a slug queen in Eugene. Right, and right. And her latest book is Date Me, Date My Dog. She has 40, I think. Uh, but uh, Mystery too. You read a couple of mine. But uh, Carola Dunn has written, I'm going to say, 30. Certainly 20 of them uh, are set in England about, uh, with the main character, uh, Daisy Dalrymple, a spunky uh, woman in her 20, in, in 1920, uh, who's solving cozies. These are mysteries where no animal ever gets hurt, but the dentists die in droves. It's, uh, you, you're never sorry to see these people go. <laughs> Yeah, we have a huge amount of talent in the area with writers. Yeah, L.J. Sellers is another local mystery writer, and she's done, started her first one was The Sex Club, about a Bible group in Springfield, Oregon, that turned out was studying a lot more than the Bible of these teenage kids. And now she has a Detective Jackson series, and her latest is, uh, what's it called? Crimes of Memory. Uh, the, of the... There's 30 of the authors will have books that are new this year at this event. Yeah, it's an amazing event, and um, it's great to be a part of it. And I have to tell you, uh, the opportunity is a gold mine for anybody. It's an opportunity to meet other writers. It's an opportunity yeah. to see other um, people doing the craft, how they love it, and also meeting the readership. It's amazing to be able to, re to, you know, to find out what they're loving, what they're looking for, and to have the opportunity to talk to them. Well, you have a, a mystery about, but it's also historical, about the Titanic. Uh, we've got a lot of other history authors going to be there. One about Oregon's coastal bridges, um, one uh, about uh, the Oregon Insane Asylum that was used as a setting for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, um, about Highway 99 here outside of Eugene, the history of the of uh, that old highway, and uh, or uh, the Governor Oswald West, uh, sports facilities, lots of lots of history, uh, and we got a whole table of poets. Uh, so there's going to be a, a dozen top poets and some kids books. Judy Sierra uh, in Springfield has done I, I'm going to say 50, and her latest is. Uh, Suppose you meet a dinosaur. And these are beautifully illustrated children's books. Uh, cookbooks, cook, cooking with honey. Uh, There's just, uh, you know, David Imus will bring his maps. He has uh, won the top award for map making in the nation year after year and has a, a new map of the entire United States, uh, which is just a, simply a must have. Get it autographed. So, lots coming up December 7th. Yeah, looking forward to it, and I hope everybody will take the time because it's a great, great opportunity and also a great uh, way to help the uh, kids out there, especially for reading. And I think that's mm -hmm. an important because I know that um, without books, my childhood would not have been as fun. The places I went, the people I traveled through time and space and all that was amazing and some of the yeah, greatest well, adventures. It turns out summer reading is a really important bridge for kids from one school year to the next, and uh, Reading throughout the summer 
really improves their performance in school the next year. So, you know, here we are as authors, we want to promote readers, uh, so it's, it's, not, it's a little bit self-serving, perhaps, to train kids to, to like books. Uh, and, and in the process, we're also selling books to people who enjoy reading them. So, with your um, years of writing experience, and knowing that, how many words do you write a day? Is it a thousand to two thousand? Yeah, never more than two. It's hard to writing is slow. Slow. It's a it's a hard job. I I I think that's a great because I hear people always you know I put out six thousand and I'm always amazed by them. I know I do about two thousand a day. I either yeah. write I write in a book or I also write a daily column that I put together and put on the internet about my muses of that day, what I found. You know, talk about anything and. I know that around 1,600 words is really good for me. I can do that easily. And it's not a chore. It's not me forcing myself, but it's also making myself do it. And it's a great exercise. Yeah. So what would you recommend for writers out there, new ones, thinking about this, no matter what age they are? Because be, you can start writing anytime. What do you think about how do we encourage the newer talent to come out and try it? Because... It is, it's, nowadays, most people think, well, I can easily put a book on Amazon. And they can. Selling it is a whole other issue, and mm -hmm. you could do a whole, you know, a whole series on marketing books. Yeah. But getting started, what is, uh, what is your advice? Um, well, obviously, you have to actually write, and you need to read a lot. In, uh, so, read and write, obviously. Uh, don't give your work away for free. Uh, don't just throw it up on the internet and then later think, oh, well now I should start selling it. Too late. It's already gone. Uh, and, and then you really do need to, to think about publicity. Uh, all too often I'll get an author who sends me an email, calls me up and says, okay, I just printed 10,000 copies of my novel. What do I do now? And I go, oh my God, it's... Uh, you could have talked to me like a year ago, and before you printed those, we could have talked about where you're going to uh, promote this, how you get it into the bookstores, uh, and and then logically print like maybe 500 or 1,000 copies instead of 10,000, because you'll never sell that many, or if you do, it'd just be a miracle. Uh, So there are a lot of mistakes that can be made, uh, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there, and especially now, it's uh, not that difficult to get a book out on the internet. The hard part is to get people to buy it, and to do that, you need to do some social networking, and if that 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 can mean going to libraries and bookstores and giving talks, uh, I do a lot of that. It can mean uh, going on Facebook and getting a thousand friends, uh, or go to Goodreads and start reading and recommending other books. And, and every time you sign off, have a little note saying, uh, William Sullivan is the author of 17 books, click here to read his latest, or a sample of, of his latest. Uh, and saying so gradually then, word will get out, but it won't do it by accident, you have to do it yourself. So you have to walk the walk and do all the fun stuff of, uh, we all want to just be writers. And I know there's a lot of people out there who think all I want to do is writing and I'll find an agent and a, a publishing house that will take care of the rest. And we both know that's gone, as you've said already before. Did that, it ever exist? You're thinking I, Emily Dickinson, you know, she did that. And uh, her stuff was unknown during her lifetime. And after she died, then it became all famous. So... I think that works if you're willing to be famous long after you're dead. And I think people forget <laughs> that Mark Twain and people like uh, uh, Charles Dickens and all those did many talks. They went all over the world, always talking about their books, always doing. Uh, Dickens even did a, a Christmas Carol reading, he, and that mm -hmm. was a big thing. He did it around the states. He did it all over Europe. You know, uh, of course, um, Mark Twain was always on the tours going and doing talks so yeah. it wasn't like they were just sitting there and writing 
That's yeah. That that is a fallacy that we were given from the fifties on that you become a writer. Yeah, yeah. And granted, there was the advantage of a lot of publications. Um, with the advent of some of the publications going away, is there an avenue there lost for writers now that they can't just go off and sell a story for twenty-five to a hundred and five? Well, now it would be what uh, a couple of hundred if they're lucky. Is that still available, or is that a a bygone era? Well, the, the era of selling a story is pretty much gone. The uh, I have a collection of short stories coming out. I have a a sample uh, of it Ooh. out now. It's a publicity sample, but it's gonna, the book will be called The Oregon Variations and come out in April of 2014. One short story set in every county in Oregon. Uh, all, all different kinds of people and stories. Uh, but what I found about short stories really now is that the market uh, is mostly literary uh, publications. So these are going to be university uh, publications that are created and judged by uh, professors and masters of fine arts, doctoral students uh, or graduate students. So they're looking for a modern contemporary American style of short stories, which means not much plot, uh, characters you don't like very much, and uh, it ends sort of drifting off. It's not your traditional short story and not what's known uh, in, the, in the world of short stories outside of the U.S., where you have uh, Haruki Murakami and Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Elizabeth Allende, people doing fascinating stuff that often had, involves magical realism, thing, never allowed in the U.S., where they'd call it science fiction. But it's very interesting to have suddenly your words turn into a butterfly and float away, and it's it's a image. Um, so this, the, I think, American uh, short fiction has been kind of hijacked by the by this modern contemporary university style that is not really bought. You don't see people actually buying these the, these books. The, the short stories that are bought now are, a lot of them, foreign. And perhaps, well, maybe, maybe uh, I'm hoping to strike a blow for uh, having some American fiction that people want to read, want to read, because there's interesting plots with twists and characters that you like. Uh, and maybe a little bit of magical realism's okay now and then to surprise people. Looking forward to it. Yeah, you, you still need to have all the best writing you can possibly do, the most beautiful writing you you can imagine. But there needs to be more than that, and 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 I think this is where contemporary American short fiction has has lost its readership. Very well put. So where can people find you, your books, <laughs> and uh, also we know that the again mentioned. Uh, the December 7th uh, Artists and uh, Writers Fair. Or if you're in Fair. Eugene, uh, come down there. Uh, they ask a dollar to five dollars donation to get into the fair, but won't throw you out. Yeah. And uh, have 50 authors there autographing their books from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, of course, online you can find me. My website's OregonHiking.com. So go to OregonHiking.com, you'll find all 17 of my books and can read samples or get them either uh, sent to you from Powell's or Amazon or download them electronically. Also, if I remember it, I saw a whole mess of them at uh, Smith Family. If you're in Eugene, yeah. Smith Family is good enough to have a row of them right by the cash yeah, register. Yeah, it's always fun. I always like going there because I oh, I know that guy. <laughs> well, and as it turns out, uh, some of these hiking guides... Well, altogether, they are. Uh, that's the best-selling series in Oregon. The, the 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 local hiking guides like this. This one is probably. I know it's the best-selling book in the history of the bookstore and sisters, and this one is on the top ten list most summers at Powell's in Portland. Um, people really need to books to tell them where to go hiking and how to get out and do this stuff. And hiking's free, so. It's a pretty healthy thing to do, and 
the trick is to have uh, a book that that uh, doesn't get people lost and instead gets them inspired. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you. I hope we can do it again sometime. It's a and, pleasure. Uh, as always, please keep reading. Remember, people, the uh, best way to feed an author's soul is to read their books and blogs. And uh, the best way to feed their stomach is to buy their books. So uh, don't forget to buy a book. Have a great day.